Okay, everybody can hear me? Awesome. Hey everyone, uh, Brandon Sang, president and co-founder of Shield AI. Prior to founding Shield, uh, was a Navy SEAL, spent seven years in the Navy, deployed twice to Afghanistan, once to the Pacific, uh, once to the Persian Gulf. I'm a mechanical engineer and uh, founded Shield AI to protect service members and civilians with artificially intelligent systems, founded the company in 2015. Uh, in pursuit of that mission, we're building the world's best AI pilot and applying it to a variety of different aircraft. You saw the quadcopter, you saw our VBAT, we're also applying it to uncrewed jets. Um, have had products since 2018, uh, and I will just, I think some fun facts. We are the only company in the world with an aircraft that can operate without GPS, without communications, uh, and without a remote pilot. Uh, we are also the only, you know, the company in the world with the most flight hours flying fighter jets completely autonomously. So that's just some additional background context that you, the video may or may not have provided. Hey, uh, I'm Corey Weinberg. I'm a reporter for The Information. I cover late stage private tech companies and IPOs. Um, let's talk about your business. Let's talk a little bit about the, the, uh, the industry and, and sort of what approach you're taking to it. It's obviously a really apt time and unfortunately really relevant time to be talking about the sort of future of, of sort of war and, and sort of the systems that the military is using. Um, and there's, as uh, I think Steve sort of mentioned earlier, all a host of ethical questions uh, that I'm sure you're dealing with every day. Um, I wanted to start off, uh, you were recently a, uh, a big part of a Netflix documentary, um, which uh, I thought you were going to maybe play a trailer from it. But the, the film, it was a documentary called Killer Robots. And I wonder what you made of that title. So the, the producers told me the title was going to be AI and the Future of Warfare, and then they, Netflix did an A-B test and got 10 times more clicks on uh, the title Killer Robots. And so, um, <laughs> look, I, I, uh, I got a good chuckle out of it. We take it very seriously. Um, actually, we, we tried to get a sense, and they said, hey, you know, you guys are depicted very well in this. Uh, after watching it, I thought we, that we were. And um, look, I, I think that, is, that title is clickbait, right? And I was telling the, the LPs here earlier, um, there's a lot of thought, there's a lot of science, there's a lot of engineering that goes into architecting these systems, right? Everybody's head always wants to go straight to the matrix, straight to the Terminator. Uh, it's not like that if you're actually building these things. I told people, right, the, the probabilities of an AI uh, you know, on one of our aircraft just all of a sudden becoming sentient and deciding to, you know, become a killer robot are the same odds of your car just deciding to take off and start being a flying car, right? That's not what the system is engineered towards. Um, it's where a lot of people's minds like to race to. And then I also just think, I, I do think the documentary did uh, a pretty good job just talking about the ethical use of AI uh, as it relates to the use of uh, lethal force. And I was uh, talking to the group earlier about that, and I would just say, uh, I think the U.S. military, I think NATO has have been very thoughtful in their policies. This is one of the areas where the policy is actually way out in front of the technology. Um, as a former SEAL who has had to make moral decisions about the use of lethal force, uh, I fundamentally believe, we at SHIELD AI fundamentally believe it's a very human uh, decision to make and will never be the role of an AI to do so. Um, and at the end of the day, what our AI is doing is it is providing intelligence for uh, decision makers to make better decisions, right? We're alleviating this fog of war um, so that ground force commanders can, can make the right decisions. And where right now in, in sort of your technology uh, is reliability the highest and where are still the edge cases where you're still working things out, not ready to be deployed in the field? Yeah, it's actually a, a fantastic question. The core of our efforts, right, are actually around uh, building reliable products um, and, and making the autonomy work in a way that you would expect it to work. Um, the, there is no new science. There is no new uh, physics you know, that has to be invented or introduced here. Um, all, all of these systems and approaches have been proven out uh, in labs, and right. but it takes a lot of work to commercialize it. It takes a lot of work to make it reliable, uh, repeatable, et cetera. So that, that is the core of what we focus on. I think we have very, very reliable products. I will make the comment, there is a, there is a very big difference uh, between the self-driving car market and the military market as it relates to reliability, right? 
you'll hear Elon Musk talk about needing to get to nine nines of reliability uh, for consumers to be ready to adopt driverless cars. Nine nines of reliability requires billions of dollars of investment, is a very, very hard thing to achieve. Um, and when you think about it, right, myself as a consumer, and I, and I have two Teslas, it's, it's not a big, you know, lift on myself to say, you know what, I don't want to employ self-driving. I'm just going to drive the car, right? So I'll wait for nine nines of reliability to do that. The military is actually in a fundamentally very different spot, right? Their alternatives, they don't have alternatives uh, to not having self-driving aircraft, right? They can't operate those drones because uh, the Russians, the Chinese, they jam GPS, they jam communications, which our drones rely on, and they can't send in human pilots because it's way too dangerous. So you ask them, hey, what are your